Hi, Debbie Samuels here, and welcome to another Grit Online. Well, if there is one sport in the Winter Olympics that makes the hair on my arm stand up, that is bobsledding. We're gonna be speaking to an Olympian today whose passion is bobsledding, and it grows way beyond that. So please invite your friends to join us on Grit Online as we walk through different aspects of being an athlete, coach, or a parent of an athlete. Thank you for being with us today at Grit Online. So welcome to Grit Online. We have today a crazy female bobsledder. I mean, she's legit. She is one of the most decorated Olympians in Canadian history. She is the current World Cup champion in the monobob and the two-man women's bobsled. And she's just, she's just won a lot. She knows what she's doing. And so, Kaylee, the first question I want to ask you is, can you describe for us what it's like bobsledding? Because when we watch the Olympics, or at least when I do, this looks like the scariest thing ever. <laughs> it's like NASCAR and ice. Um, yeah, overall, bobsledding is super fun. I enjoy it. It's not like a roller coaster at all. So a lot of people, that up feeling that you get, you never lose your stomach at any point. Um, there's a lot of speed involved, a lot of G-forces involved. So velocity and the speed going down, you get a lot of pressure, kind of like when you have to go like this and you just feel everything get really tight. Um, it's not as smooth and as nice as it looks on TV. I will admit when I watch bobsledding and some of you know, the male events, I'm always like, oh, that looks actually really nice. It's a little bit rough. Um, there's no springs or shocks. There's nothing to absorb. So you definitely go from a flat surface onto the side of a wall uh, in next to no time very quickly, and then you'll push through some pressure. My job, I'm a pilot. I'm the person at the front of the sled. So women now have two events in bobsled. We have the two-man event. So we have a pilot, the person at the front that drives and steers, and a brakeman at the back. And then women now also have a monobob event. So it's one person that pushes, jumps in, drives down, and pulls the brakes at the end. Um, and so I'm the pilot at the front. And I'm responsible for driving through all the twists and turns and corners and everything that's associated with getting the bobsled down. Um, it's about a mile to a mile and a half long. Every track around the world is completely different. There's a lot of visualization involved, a lot of studying I have to do, um, and then a lot of physical training. The sled itself weighs about 350 pounds. So when you're pushing it alone, that's very heavy, and you're trying to do it over a very short period of time. 50 meters as fast and all out as I can possibly go. Sometimes I've got a teammate, sometimes it's just me. Um, but the sport is awesome. I love it. I get to be fierce and intense and very, very focused. The sport requires me to. Uh, one of the big downfalls of the sport is obviously that you can launch yourself out of the track and ultimately die. So we try not to have that uh, happen and take all the safety protocols, but that is one. So I have to be very focused, very in the moment, every single second that I'm inside that sled. When I'm controlling it, I've got my teammates' life in my hands too. They have to trust me and be willing to put their life in my hands. So I have to pay attention and be on it. But to me, those are skills that I possess, that I enjoy, that it's a, a feeling that has always been very familiar to me. And so I like the intensity that the sport brings. And, the focus and the fierceness at the same point. I get to, to go out, there's a finesse, there's a feeling, there's something soft about driving a sled. It's not big, hard, rough turns. The sled in itself and the G-forces require that, but I and the steers that I do are so minute, they're so fine, they're, they're so delicate, I have to be able to feel every inch and put the sled an inch higher, an inch lower to, t to take that perfect line. And so there's a finesse piece mixed with a lot of intensity. And um, yeah, I just love the sport. So being a beginner in bobsled, how was, how was it the first time you ever did that? What, was the, what were the emotions? The first time I ever went down in a bobsled, it was terrifying, I won't lie. Um, they don't really teach you what to do. They just kind of push you off 
And I mean, they teach you what to do, but you still, it's, it's a feeling that is indescribable. I honestly can never fully, and anyone that's gone down in a sled will attest to this. There's no other feeling in the world like it. There's nothing I can tell you or prepare you for. Um, the G-forces that I feel in my body are similar to what um, an Air Force pilot would feel. They pull them a lot longer than we do, but it's, it's that similar feeling. Um, at the same point, the, the speed and the pressure, and it's not just in my hands when I steer the sled. I feel it in my body. I feel it through my butt, I, through my back. Um, I have to brace myself. I can see it with my eyes, and my mind has to already be one step ahead every step of the way, whether I've made a mistake or not, and whether it's perfect. And so it's a combination in the whole body, mentally and physically, and there's no way to really describe it. But when you first go down, you don't know any of that. So it's kind of just, here you go. And it is very overwhelming. I won't lie, a lot of people, we've literally had people just, thank you, see you later, I'm out, and walk off. We've had people that will come back the next day, do a couple runs, and then leave. Um, that's a normal occurrence. Usually when we get five or six girls to come out at the start of the year, at least one of them is not sticking around. One or two won't stick around. And, and same with the guys. The men's team is the exact same. You get a couple out of a very small group that it's just not for them. It's a very unique feeling. Um, it's overwhelming. It's exhilarating. It's exciting. It's scary. But it's fun all at the exact same time in one. And so you definitely become more accustomed to it and you enjoy it a lot more the longer that you do it. So when you're competing, particularly at that level, what do you have like a strategy when you've got, you know you've got the other teams there and you know the speeds that they do? What, what is the, in the competition, what's the strategy? For me personally, and every competitor is going to be different. Every athlete, it doesn't matter what sport, is going to have a different mind frame going in. For me personally, a big portion of it is to control what I can control and to run my own race. Not actually run it, but my race is my race. Um, fortunately, in my sport, I compete against the clock more than I do my competitors. The fastest time wins. Combined time after a couple runs is the ultimate at the Olympic Games. And so it's me against the clock, it's me against the track, it's my teammate and me against what we're trying to achieve and be the fastest. Um, if I make a mistake, if something happens, it, it costs me. I can't control what my competitors do, whether they're German or Swiss or another American team or the Canadians. I don't know if they've had a good run, a bad run, if they've made mistakes, if they've nailed it perfectly. All I can do is control my own outcome. So my strategy, a big part of it, is to run my own race. It's to control what I can control. So I stand on that start line. Going into the race, I make sure I've had a good night's sleep. I've eaten properly in the buildup to it. I've done everything possible to have no regrets, to know that there's zero reason why I can't win that race. And then once I start, once we start running and pushing that sled, it's all about strength, power. And I will literally self-talk my way the entire way down the bobsled track. Um, I jump in the sled, corner one, corner two, corner three. I know where I have to be. If I make a mistake, how do I get back on track? Um, and I continue all the way down into the bottom. Um, I try not to think about an end result. I try not to think about what could happen, what couldn't happen. I try to live very much in the moment and just be the best version of myself. And it's been a journey. It's been a process. I haven't always been the very best. You know, I, as in life, you learn as you go through and every single step can be used. And, you know, I never lose. I learn. And that, that saying for sure is true. And so I've had many moments where I've learned a lot. Um, and at the same point, that's made me the athlete that I am. And I take a lot of you know, my, my wins and my losses and move forward to try and be the best version of myself. And on race day, I try and produce the best possible run that I can do. And it's me and my teammate or myself and Monobob and just us against the track and the clock. So what is your faith story? What your faith journey? And how does that inform your competing? For me, a big part 
of my faith is understanding that I have my own path and my own journey and I trust in God. When I get on that starting line, I think ultimately it's, it's kind of like a superpower. Um, it's a way for me to relieve a bit of pressure and, and stress that's associated with high performance. You're standing at the line of the Olympics. There's a lot you can't control. You don't know the outcome. You want to just win and you have all these feelings and emotions. And so to give myself and to just let that go, to trust in God that this is, you know, the outcome will be what it is. I will do the best work I can, that I've been given the strength and power and courage and bravery to approach um, the sport and the steps that are needed. Um, I've learned along the way and that this is the path. And so when I can put my faith in God and I can put my faith in something bigger than myself, um, it's, it provides me a confidence and a power that I can't get from anywhere else. And so I draw on that and that helps me a lot uh, in sport in general and a lot of different aspects. Is there, um, are there moments of grace that you feel when you win and then when you lose, that for you, sure. for you get from, from God? Yep, there definitely is. I mean, when you win, it's pretty easy. Thank you. <laughs> that's, a, you know, that's a common one. Um, I think it's a bit harder to do the same thing when you lose, when you, know, you haven't achieved all of the hopes and goals and dreams and everything, the grandioso plan that you thought. Um, at the same point, you know, that's where those lessons come in. Um, I'm thankful every single day that I can do this as my profession for my sponsors, my family, my friends, everyone that supports me. This isn't just me doing it. It definitely takes a village spiritually as well as physically. And so um, regardless of, of what the outcome, you know, there definitely is, you know, grace involved, I think, in any sport across the board. And the high performance level is a bit more of just an extreme version of what you get playing in your backyard. But at the end of the day, it's all the same. I'm physically healthy and able to do what I love and I've got the support to be able to do it. And so um, the constant thank, thankfulness that I have and get and that the grace of God and from my community that I'm able to, to do what it is that I love is also another area where I draw huge strength from. Yeah. And so you have proven on a world stage that you have a great competitive edge. But one of the things that you are championing is equality of sports uh, for women. Tell us what that looks like in bobsledding. So I always grew up understanding that, you know, I could be and do anything that I wanted to. It was gonna take sacrifice and dedication. But at the end of the day, if I committed to it, I was provided the opportunity and I could be and do whatever it, it was that I wanted. And it wasn't until I came into bobsled that I was told as a, as a woman, you're not strong enough, you're not fast enough, you're not skilled enough. For majority of my career, women only had one event. Men in bobsled had two events. They had the two men and the four man event, women just had the two man event. Um, women's bobsledding, the first Olympics it was in was 2002, the men, go back to the 60s, 1960 something, I wanna say it might even be before that. Um, and so there really is a big inequality piece within our sport, women, I was around when we weren't paid the same. Um, I was around when we weren't allowed on all the same bobsled tracks as the men, we had our own circuit because we weren't skilled enough to drive. And so overall, we weren't allowed in the same start houses at the men, these ones for the men, you get a C crate that has heaters in it outside. Um, and so, and that's in my lifetime and I'm 35. So it's, you know, it's not that far removed to understand that these are real challenges that have come up that women in bobsled have faced. And I think with that and understanding that it was very hard for me to, as a woman to accept that. I got to the point after I won my second Olympic gold medal, how do I challenge myself? How do I get better? How do I raise that bar? And not just for me personally with my own skill, but how do I create a better space for women in sport long past when I'm gone? And so I fought for years for women to have equal medal opportunity. I, if the men get two events at Olympics, I want two chances to win medals too. Why do we not get the same? Um, and so I petitioned 
Um, I competed against the men and with the men in the four-man event. Uh, that took a lot of convincing, but it, for two years, competed with and, and against the men in, in their own discipline. Um, one of the years, I took an all-female crew to prove that we could do it. We are fast enough, strong enough, skilled enough to do what was classified as a men's event as females and to try and empower the other women to challenge themselves and you know to push boundaries and limits and to increase participation. That ultimately is the goal. How do we get more women involved in sport? How do we get more women involved in bobsledding? Uh, at the Olympic level in bobsled, even to date, men get 120 accreditations at an Olympics. So the badges that you wear, women get 40. So there's a very big discrepancy in the amount of women versus the amount of men. Now men get two events, women get one event. So a lot of that, you basically, they get more competitors across the board, two men, four men. Four men doubles the number just right off the bat. And so a lot more men are competing. And it's not that there aren't enough women. There are plenty that want to do it. The opportunity to race is not there, and it was never there. Um, so in me and one of the other American athletes, actually, Alana Myers-Taylor, uh, we both went out and basically showed the guys that we could do this. We are skilled enough, fast enough, strong enough to do this. Um, and so that led to last season being the first ever world championship for a brand new event called Monobob. It's not for men like the men, but we have a second event. So there is medal equality within bobsled now. Um, and I will continue to, to fight. And hopefully men get this Monobob event and women can do for men. And both genders can have all events uh, to compete in Olympics. That's my ultimate goal. I don't know if I'll get there in my sport and career lifetime, but by the end of me leaving sport, that is my goal. Um, and just, again, create more opportunity for athletes to, to grow, to be better, um, not just physically, but mentally and through skill and provide just greater opportunity for any athlete to, to feel safe and to be able to take what it is they love and showcase that toward the world. So in Beijing, there will be a monobob and a two-man bob Correct. for the women. Yes, so this coming Olympics in 2022 uh, will be the first ever monobob Olympic event. So medals are getting handed out. There will be a first ever Olympic champion. And then moving forward, women um, will have two events now, just like the men do. So you have advocated for campaigns. One is called um, I've Been Bullied, and one is called The Right to Play. How did, how did that come about, and how was that sort of in your story before you championed those campaigns? Um, so both campaigns that I've been a part of um, are dear to my heart. Obviously, Right to Play um, started by a former speed skate Olympian a while ago. Um, and we're able to take, I went over to Africa and we were able to take a bunch of sporting equipment over to places around the world that wouldn't have access to such sporting equipment. We're able to help teach and encourage um, the local parents or community leaders and get the community involved to run their own sporting programs. We believe that through the power of play and through the power of sport, a lot of life skills can be learned. Leadership, um, goal setting, the list goes on and on. And so we wanna be able to empower play, especially in war-torn areas or areas where they wouldn't have access financially or by any other means to have the equipment. And then through play, you know, as human beings, we can grow and learn and develop. And so um, I went over to, to Africa to hand deliver and the equipment and just being a part of such a big organization and a community that believes in sport so passionately, being involved in something that, you know, I've been so blessed with having access to sport and understanding and the opportunities I've been given that I want everybody around the world, regardless of where you come from, you know, financial backgrounds, whatever, to have access to those same skills um, to be able to learn and develop and grow as a human. And so um, to be able to 
you know, impart that on anybody from around the world is huge. And so I love Right to Play for, for championing that cause. And the I've Been Bullied campaign specifically, um, I was bullied a lot as a child growing up, and I was different. I now understand why in regards to I'm very intense when I get around sport. Um, I'm the, you know, the super intense yes. female chick that's <laughs> in the corner that just wants to win every time. That is me at the same point. You know, I enjoy team sports very much. I enjoy single sports. I, any sport in particular, even if I'm not the best at it, like surfing, let me tell you, I'm not good at surfing. I have tried. It's really hard, way harder than anybody says. However, I will continue to brave the elements keep trying. But I love sports in general and across the board. Um, but as a child growing up, it wasn't always the most popular. I wasn't always the cool kid. I rode a lot of chairlifts by myself. Um, Jello shoved in my sleeping bag for being different, for looking different, for acting different. Um, the things that make me different and unique make me the world's best bobsled female driver of all time. And so I now recognize those things. But as a 14 and 13 year old child, you know, what is it about me? I don't understand why am I getting teased and bullied and having jello shoved in my sleeping bag? What, why are these things happening? And so I want other kids to be aware that, you know, we're all unique, we're all different. We all have something that makes us special and that's to be cherished. And we, we don't deserve, nor do we have the right individually to, you know, put our feelings or emphasis on somebody else. Who am I to say what's cool? or not cool? Who am I to judge somebody based on their hair color, their ethnicity, their skin color, their background, their gender? That's not for me. You know, that's for God to judge us individually in our own actions, not, not for me specifically to judge anybody else. So I want to make sure that people understand that it's not, a, it's not okay, it's not right, bullying needs to stop, and that ultimately, you know, even if you are a child that has been bullied, that it shouldn't stop your growth and development. You shouldn't change who you are find a different group of people, find people that love you and your tribe elsewhere, you know, and those are the people you should, you should hang out with and be around more. Um, and I want other kids and, and or adults to, to feel empowered and to be able to put themselves in the best scenarios to thrive and grow as humans. When it seems like bullies, when they go after somebody, they go after really their true identity. And, and that, that people should be proud of whatever identity that is. For us, it's being children of God. Um, for you, it's being a crazy bobsledder. And when I talked to you before, I know your love for Canada. Um, I know you, you, you carried the, the Canadian flag in the opening ceremony, so that's... Yeah, that's pretty Canadian, but you are competing for the United States now. Not that we mind. Oh, Canada, <laughs> sorry, not sorry. <laughs> we are glad to have you, but tell us that story. Yeah. I have competed, competed for 16 years for Team Canada, and I found myself in an environment where I felt unsafe. I was with a coach that made me feel unsafe, that would routinely, verbally and mentally abuse me. And when I acknowledged it, I got cut from the team and basically ousted. And um, that was really hard for me to understand and, and to take. And so I reached out to Team USA at that point. I didn't want my career to be over. I didn't want that to be the end of my story. I felt there was more that I could give to the sport. And it wasn't fair, it wasn't right that I would get yelled and screamed at on a daily basis. It wasn't fair that- And was that attacking your identity, did you feel? It would attack me personally. I, I would get yelled at personally, professionally. Um, you know, I was told I was letting my country down, my teammates down. Um, I wasn't like or respected. It was an onslaught of yelling and screaming in my face in public, public scenarios. So there's that embarrassment factor of where and when, when people look at you as an Olympic champion, it's not just in my own country, it's, it's worldwide. I've got a big target on my back 
going into an Olympic Games as an Olympic champion. People want to know, what am I doing? What am I, what equipment, you know, how have I prepared? And to be embarrassed to such a degree at, you know, 32 years old at the top of a track that I'm in tears crying, it was an unfair scenario and I no longer felt safe mentally or physically and it didn't matter, you know, how many times it happened and I'm a very strong-willed woman. I like to think of myself as being very strong mentally and I broke. I ended up um, going into a depressive state. I ended up having a lot of physical ailments as well. And through that working with a sports psychologist and a psychologist, I understood a bit more of my environment and surroundings. And through that, I was empowered to make a change. And the only change that I knew how to do was to speak up. I spoke up uh, and doing so I got punished for speaking up. Uh, so I left, I walked away, turned around and phoned up Team USA and said, hey, I don't wanna end my career this way. I don't want somebody to be able to just wipe me out. Um, I'm married to an American now. Would you consider me joining your team? I called some of the athletes on the team and made sure it was okay with them. Knowing we were competitors at some point, I didn't wanna you know, walk on toes or create animosity. Um, I was made to make the team just like any other athlete. I wasn't given a spot. It didn't matter how many Olympic medals I had. I had to buy a bobsled. I had to do every single testing protocol that any person or any other athlete would be required to do in order to prove my worth and prove that I deserved to be on the team. And I respected that and that process. And I did it, made the team, and now I very happily and for the remainder of my career will represent Team USA. Uh, within my first year of coming back, I won world championships last year, 2021 as well. So 2020 and 2021, I won world championships in two men. And then I'm the first ever women's monobob world champion for 2021 for Team USA. So I am extremely honored to represent a country that has provided such opportunity. Um, you know, land of the free, home of the brave, yeah. all of the above. <laughs> I fully embody all of that. Um, and so not only was it a great place to live and, and be a part here in Carlsbad, um, it, it has provided much more to my life and, and to my career. Um, I'm around teammates and coaches that respect what I bring to the table, that value what I've learned in the sport, that as a female athlete, I have a voice and a power and say in my performance. You know, I get questions, what do you need? How do you become the best? How can we empower you? And um, these are questions I never got a part of Team Canada. And so it, uh, I appreciate the, the high performance within the Olympic world of bobsledding here on Team USA. And I definitely feel like I've found my home. I found my place mm -hmm. with my people where I belong and it feels really nice. Yeah. And, w and when we were talking, you said it wasn't so much the Canadian Olympic Committee as the federation, uh, the bobsled federation, and we've had our problems here with um, USA Gymnastics, with women. What would you like to see happen with the federations to, for more transparency and to help the athletes to just be, you know, to, to rise to the, their own level of, of what they've worked for? Um, I would love to see athletes be empowered more um, in making decisions built around their own performance. Obviously, coaches bring insight, um, but ultimately, coaches have a, f a lot of power and a lot of say. Athletes are in a very vulnerable position in regards to your hopes and goals and dreams. What you work for for years is up to a decision of a coach. Um, those people name the team. They determine who gets therapy, what team you make, who your teammates are, what equipment you get. Um, and the list goes on and on. And all of these things affect performance. And you're vulnerable to somebody in the wrong position abusing the power. And I found myself in a position that you're right. It wasn't, you know, the Canadian Olympic team was great. But that only happens for a couple weeks every four years. The rest of the time you're with your, your national federation. And 
If you've got great coaches, you will never experience it. And my goal is that every athlete never experiences any type of abuse, whether physical, mental, sexual of any type. Um, but with power comes responsibility, accountability, and you get the wrong person in there. And we are extremely vulnerable to that abuse of power and that abuse of process. And there's nothing you can do or say in those scenarios, um, which is why a lot of it goes unnoticed for so long. And it's the way that the system has been. And I admire USA in general for bringing to light such harsh topics. Um, and hopefully throughout this process, we can empower or we can create kind of a third party body. That's, this is what I would love to see is some type of independent third party body that governs kind of like with drug testing, they use a group called WADA, World Anti-Doping Association. And they govern the entire world to make sure nobody's cheating um, with drugs or any other types of steroids or stuff like that. But I hope we can create something similar where the world is all governed. It doesn't matter if you're bobsled or gymnastics or skiing or figure skating. It doesn't matter if you're USA, Canadian, German, Austrian, Swiss, that we're all governed around the same rules and that we can hopefully eradicate, you know, verbal mental abuse, harassment, sexual abuse that occurs, any type of abuse of power and that as athletes, we're held accountable through our performance. We do bad, we don't make a team, but that coaches and leaderships and CEOs and high performance directors, they're also accountable, not to the performance piece as much as to their own actions and making sure that processes are fair on how athletes make teams. Um, you know, that coaches and leaders can't abuse the power that they have and that they're given and that, you know, there's a stricter policy built around what constitutes abuse and harassment and that we can hopefully all be held accountable for it and eradicate it as much as humanly possible so that ultimately bullying on every level, whether you know it's in a high school or an elementary right up to an Olympic level of sport, that that stops. And so you are at the top of your game in bobsledding. What do you see your future What's the projection of your future? Because ultimately, every athlete's body uh, betrays them. Yeah. At some point. <laughs> yes. I have no doubt at some point my body will revolt. Um, I don't know what the future holds. And again, coming back to faith, this is a big part where faith comes into it. I trust that at some point, God will come down. He will physically stop me and or... I will feel like there is, my time is done. And I hope that I'm in a position where I get to leave sport on my own terms, where I choose to leave because it no longer serves me. I choose to walk away from sport having achieved, I could end tomorrow and be extremely satisfied with where I'm at. I just want it to be on my own terms. Um, I don't want someone else to tell me you're done or you should quit. Um, I wanna leave when I feel like I've given everything I can to the sport and creating a better place for women and other bobsledders and that the sport grows and continues to grow and develop and provide more opportunities for athletes across the board. And so I will walk away when that feeling occurs. It's not happened yet. Uh, I still feel like there's a lot I can do internally as an athlete. There's a lot more that I physically can achieve. And through doing that, I can help push those limits and boundaries. I can create more opportunities and help have some of those tough conversations that need to be had in sport. And I'm more powerful as an athlete doing that. So I'm gonna to continue to, to compete. Fire's still burning. Gotta get back on top of that podium and win some medals for Team USA. That's my ultimate goal. So short term, Beijing 2022, win some Olympic gold medals for Team USA. Long term, don't really know how long that's gonna go on for, um, but I, I trust that I will know that when that moment comes. Um, and after that point, I'm not sure. I know I want to have a family at some point with my husband. And so that'll be on the cards, God willing, whenever. And, uh, none of us know the future. Yeah. yeah. yeah I can't really answer that question, but I will do it as long as I'm physically able to. And as long as mentally my, and my heart's in it in the right place. So we have been talking to Kaylee. Humphreys, Armbruster, 
Beijing, look for her, cheer for her. I would say pray for her, but you, you know. Do that too? Yeah, I mean, we will. I'm but, all for it. I yeah. will take all the prayers humanly possible. I will be up there praying. Don't yeah. worry. Um, but yes, all of the above. And so until next time, watch for Kaylee. <laughs>